Well, good morning. The most important people are here. <laughs> uh, the committee will come to order, and I thank everyone for joining us this morning, and I want to especially thank the witness for being here with us today. Uh, this morning, the committee will examine the management and performance of SBA's Office of Credit Risk Management, otherwise known as OCRUM. It's responsible for conducting oversight of SBA's lender, and it is it is $120 billion, 7A and 504 loan portfolios. All of us are acutely aware that access to capital plays a vital role in the success of our nation's 30 million small businesses. Without it, small businesses cannot stock their shelves, pay their employees, or upgrade equipment. Capital is the key to unlocking opportunities to grow and create new jobs in the local economy. Yet, this committee has heard from numerous small businesses from across the country, and they consistently tell us that one of the biggest challenges they face is accessing affordable capital. The SBA 7A loan program plays an essential role in filling the gap left by the private markets. In, 20, in FY 2019, almost 52,000 small businesses were approved for 7A loans, injecting over $23 billion in long-term capital into local communities across the country and supporting approximately 500,000 jobs. To optimize SBA lending programs, the SBA established the Office of Credit Risk Management within the Office of Capital Access. Ocrum conducts reviews of lenders to ensure that they are complying with the program requirements. While the office played an important role in lender oversight, unprecedented growth in the program combined with deficiencies identified by GAO in SBA's credit risk management prompted congressional action. To that end, Congress passed the 7A Lending Oversight Reform Act, which codified OCROM and gave it the tools needed to conduct proper oversight and hold non-compliant lenders accountable. Today, I would like to learn more about how the SBA is implementing the legislation. The regulation was expected to be finalized months ago, so I am eager to hear when the final rule will be published. Secondly, I would like to find out what is currently working at Ocrum and what more can be done to address the ongoing concern the Inspector General has with high-dollar early default loans, which present a significant credit risk to the 7A program. And finally, I would like to know more about the steps you're taking to address the concerns of the Inspector General's November report. The report highlighted some areas where there's room for improvement, and my motto always is, if it is not perfect, let's make it better. So, on the heels of the IG report and in anticipation of SBA's budget submission to Congress, this hearing is a timely one. We look forward to hearing from the Director of the Office of Credit, Credit Risk Management, Ms. Susan Streit, regarding the challenges she, faced, she has faced since taking over at Ocrum, as well as whether there are any additional tools Congress can provide Ocrum as it works to continue strengthening the 7A loan program. Again, I want to thank the witness for being here today, and I now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Shabbat, for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, financing for a small business entrepreneur or startup is the fuel that turns the nation's economic engine on and propels it forward. It can be the key to transforming an idea into the next uh, great American product or service. Unfortunately, as our economy moves forward, access to capital remains one of the top challenges for the nation's job creators. When financing options are limited, Small businesses have the option of turning to the SBA, the Small Business Administration, and its numerous lending programs. These public-private partnerships offer government guarantees 
based upon a multitude of factors. Annually, these programs provide capital assistance to small businesses all across the country, including in America's greatest state, Ohio. However, with any federal government program, vigorous and comprehensive oversight is mandatory to safeguard American taxpayer dollars. While this committee conducts congressional oversight, the SBA also dedicates an entire operating unit to this endeavor. The Office of Credit Risk Management is charged with overseeing lending partners and monitoring program risk. Last Congress, the chairwoman and I led efforts to codify this office and to ensure that it remains a top priority moving forward. That's why it's critically important that the office's director is testifying today. I'm looking forward to a productive conversation that examines each program's performance and each program's risk. Additionally, I'd like to hear how last Congress oversight bill has been implemented and whether it has provided the tools necessary to access and to assess and guard against risk within the 7-8 loan program. Each program is unique. Thus, each program requires its own specific oversight plan. I'm looking forward to examining uh, each program at this hearing. Uh, the timing of this uh, hearing is uh, fortuitous uh, because in the coming days, we'll receive the President's uh, budget and each agency's congressional budget justification, which will include fiscal year two, uh, 2021 requests. These important documents add another layer to the monitoring of these programs. I know this committee would like to continue to work with the SBA to ensure these programs run effectively and efficiently on behalf of the small businesses that truly need the SBA services. I want to thank Thank the witness for joining us this morning. Uh, welcome the conversation, and I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Shabbat. The gentleman yields back. And if committee members have an opening statement, we will ask that they be submitted for the record. I would like to explain the timing rules. The witness gets five minutes to testify, and members get five minutes for questioning. There is a lighting system to assist you. The green light comes on when you begin, and the yellow light means there is one minute remaining. The red light comes on when you are out of time, and we ask that you stay within that time frame to the best of your ability. I will now like to introduce our only witness today. Our witness is Susan Streit. Susan joined the SBA in 2016 as director of the Office of Financial Program Operations, part of the Office of, Cap for, of Capital Access. She became director of the Office of Credit Risk Management in 2017, Prior to joining the SBA, Susan spent her distinguished career engaged in SBA lending, working with a diverse array of financial services organizations, including a 7A bank, a CDC delivering the Fab Four program in Arizona, and a small business lending company with a national footprint. More recently, Susan served in senior consulting roles with Booth Allen Hamilton and FI Consulting, leading projects with USDA's Office of Rural Development and the U.S. Treasury's CDFI Fund. Ms. Strike, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Chairwoman Velasquez, Ranking Member Shabbat, and members of the committee for inviting me to speak today. It is my pleasure to appear before you as we start this new calendar year. As Director of SBA's Office of Credit Risk Management, or OCRM for short, I'm responsible for the oversight of lenders participating in the Small Business Administration's business loan programs. I bring to this position over 37 years of lending experience and a commitment to the small business community and the lending partners that serve them. In 2016, I was selected by SBA to serve as the Director of the Office of Financial Program Operations in the Office of Capital Access. While in that position, I successfully oversaw SBA's loan origination, servicing, and liquidation operations. In 2017, I became the Acting Director of OCRM and was made Permanent Director three months later by then-Administrator Linda McMahon. OCRM is responsible for developing and implementing effective risk management practices and overseeing SBA loan programs and lender participants. The four main responsibilities of my office are to provide lender oversight, monitor the entire 7A and 504 loan portfolios for performance, administer enforcement and supervision of SBA approved lenders, and when necessary, suspend or debar program part participants. In 2018, Congress passed the Small Business 7A Lending Oversight Reform Act, 
which statutorily codified the existence and responsibilities of OCRAM. I want to thank Congress and particularly the members of this committee for their work on this very important legislation. The 2018 legislation required SBA to promulgate regulations to implement certain provisions of the law. The agency has pursued this rulemaking in a dil dil diligent manner and published the proposed lender oversight rule in June 2019, one year following enactment of the law. The final rule is expected to be published by the end of the month. Over the last two years, OCRM has also been seeking ways to better fulfill its mission while adapting to the current lending environment. OCRM has accomplished this by improving its operations as well as by bringing on additional staff. In 2019, OCRM implemented nationwide expansion of the Lender Oversight Pilot Program so that one team is overseeing all federally regulated 7A lender participants. This national rollout created a consistent review methodology across the nation, improving lender oversight and resulting in a more robust, effective, and efficient lender review process. This program enhancement was coupled with a renewed focus on customer service with program participants. OCRM is increasing its number of personnel from 36 to 42 staff members in order to better fulfill its mission. OCRM has built strong and collaborative relationships with the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency as part of its lender oversight activities. These partnerships with the primary federal regulators for lenders have enabled OCRM to fulfill its mission and enhance its effectiveness in providing lender oversight of SBA program participants. I want to briefly touch upon the report that SBA's Inspector General released in 2019 regarding the oversight of high-risk lenders. The report covers lender oversight practices from 2015 to 2017, which was before I took on my role as Director of OCRM. The report offers six recommendations to improve oversight activities. We are in the process of addressing those recommendations and will continue to address the concerns raised in the report. Finally, I want the committee to know that OCRM is pursuing several significant goals during the current fiscal year to improve its ability to proactively monitor portfolio performance and identify and mitigate lender risk. These include adding microloan intermediary oversight capabilities by the end of this fiscal year, publishing the final lender oversight rule by the end of next month, revising our two OCRM SOPs, SOP 5053, which is the Supervision and Enforcement SOP, and SOP 5100, which is our Examination Manual, and continuing to enhance our partnerships with the FDIC and OCC. Thank you, Chairwoman Velasquez and Ranking Member Shabbat for inviting me to testify here today. I look forward to answering your questions and continuing to work together with you to ensure proper oversight of SBA loan programs. Thank you, uh, Ms. Strike. Um, I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, last June, the SBA published a proposed rule to implement the 7A Lending Oversight Reform Act. The agency received 35 comments uh, from the public in response uh, to, the, to the proposal. Can you uh, describe the nature of the comments uh, Ocran received in response? Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Okay, sorry. Um, I, I don't have that information, that le level of granularity with me today. I'd be happy to get that for you if you'd like. Sure. Thank you. And I, I'm happy to hear um, that the rule will be published at the end of this um, month. Will the rule be significantly different from the proposed rule, the final rule? No, not in my estimation. Not significantly different. Okay. Uh, the IG has an ongoing high-risk 7 loan review program to see if high-dollar 7A loans that defaulted early were originated and closed in complying with SBA's rules. The IG has identified numerous such loans that have created a considerable credit risk to the agency. What specific action items are you taking to make sure non-compliant lenders are held accountable. 
So Chairwoman Velasquez, the, that, the primary responsibility for that activity actually resides with my former team, the Office of Financial Program Operations, and they work closely with the OIG on those issues throughout the year and try to resolve them as quickly as they can. Now, how it impacts OCRM, mm -hmm. um, as we are involved in lender oversight, and reviews for those lenders that have actually originated those loans. We are looking and, co and, co and collaborating with our uh, team members over in OFPO to see how we can actually build upon what they're learning and make sure that we're collaborating and learning from one another, how we can help coach that lender into doing the right thing from a compliance standpoint going forward. The Oversight uh, Act gave you additional tools to deal with program violations. How and how often have you used them? We have uh, approximately, in, in a variety of ways, um, ma'am, we have uh, approximately 40 lenders uh, on the watch list, which means that they're under increased supervision. That uh, list changes almost monthly depending upon... What, what, what type of supervision? Are you coaching them? Informal mechanism or... It involves everything from voluntary agreements with them to stand down on use of delegated authority or PLP authority um, to... an. an uh, standing, standing by on sale of any loans in the secondary market without our review and permission of each and every loan transaction. So it can be a pretty uh, significant impact on those lenders. Many of those lenders are under orders from their primary federal regulators. Um, yeah. And then we have additional uh, informal and formal actions underway right now. I can't be specific as to what they are, um, as you might know, because they are confidential. Mm -hmm. And we have additional supervision actions that we take, including um, when we are conducting a review of a lender and we have concerns about the performance that is exhibited both operationally for them and in deficiencies in the loan review process, we'll call them into headquarters and have a conversation with them and give them uh, some kind of an action plan to work with us on. And so how many lenders are you dealing with in this category? Probably close to 125 at this point in time. Uh, as you, uh, Ms. Strike, as you may know, earlier this summer, a SBA loan broker pleaded guilty to SBA loan fraud amounting to more than $100 million and sentenced to prison for nine years. Back in 2013, a co-defendant was sentenced to 15 years in order to pay restitution of $91 million. Clearly, keeping track of loan brokers and agents like this is a challenge for the SBA. How effective is the care mechanism for tracking loan brokers and agents and comment on its effectiveness? Thank you, ma'am. Two, two things to think about here. One is that I am the suspension and debarment agents, agent for the SBA for all financial programs. I have the ability with OIG and OGC participation to take suspension and debarment actions against individuals that have received uh, convictions or even indictments that we are concerned that should get out of the lending industry entirely. And we do take those actions regularly. Have um, you taken such actions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the... Um, the risk that loan agents pose to the agency um, is something that we are constantly monitoring. About 11% of the portfolio in 7A has been generated through loan agent activity. We work closely as the FDIC and the OCC guidance has been provided to their lenders. We work closely with the lenders involved that have those contractual relationships with loan agents. And we work with them to manage, the, to see how they're managing the third parties that they retain, including loan agents. When we have an upcoming review of a lender. We ask them if they have third parties involved in their SBA loan operation at any stage. We uh, find out that they do have third parties. We get copies of the loan agreements that they have, of the, the, um, the contracts that they have with those, uh, with those agents. We review those as part of our overall review. And then we ask them to, for each one, we ask them to f f complete a nine-page questionnaire to give us much more detail about what's going on with our lender relationship and what services they provide. Um, that gives us a great deal of information. Now, that just began last, about the last six months, so we don't have lots of comprehensive data yet, but we are gathering it in hopes that it will give us insight into how we can manage that and monitor that more closely. So, last point. Yes. Do you have enough staff to keep track of loan brokers? Uh, Ma'am, I think it depends on what you mean by keep track. In terms of monitoring the risk in the portfolio right. and their performance for lenders, yes, at this point we do. Okay. Um, now we recognize the ranking member. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Uh, thank you for being here today, Ms. Drake. As, as you know, Congress uh, passed and President Trump signed uh, into law the Small Business 7A Lending Oversight Reform Act uh, in the last Congress. Um, while there are many provisions in the law that strengthen the SBA's ability to oversee risk, um, I want to touch on, on just one that's uh, essential for the program to serve small businesses uh, that truly need the SBA's resources. Could you walk the committee through the credit elsewhere test and how your office monitors that? <laughs> so the, uh, the legislation that you passed last year and the I would expect uh, we'll see something like this in, in the rule. Um, the credit el and we have SOPs that, des that designate what the uh, credit elsewhere rule means and how lenders comply with it. And it's very specific in the SO SOP, in SOP 5010K. Uh, and we, ap we apply and interpret that in our reviews of lender files um, so that we can determine whether or not they are actually maintaining compliance with credit elsewhere. Uh, the, uh, the challenge with Credit Elsewhere, frankly, has been that um, we, uh, we don't have an easy automated electronic solution at this point in time to check the box and determine how, we, how many of each reason uh, for Credit Elsewhere not being available have, uh, the lender may have actually checked. So it's a bit of a manual exercise for us right now in the loan review process. Uh, to, just to give you an idea of the volume of, of loan files that are reviewed, the federally regulated team reviewed 2,000 loan files last fiscal year, and that did include the SBA supervised loan files that were reviewed. Each and every one, we are manually keeping that information on spreadsheets at the moment in hopes that eventually we'll be able to actually have a database that we can include that information on and make it easier to query and gather that information and share it with you more specifically. Thank, thank you. How often does it occur that lenders uh, violate uh, the credit elsewhere test? It's interesting that you had asked that. We had a meeting about this just the other day, uh, wrapping up 2019 reviews, some of which the reports are some of them are still getting completed and getting out. And we only have one lender in all of 2019 that really in our opinion, was egregious with regard to not documenting credit elsewhere to our satisfaction. And that lender has, we've talked to that lender. That's good to hear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Congress was notified uh, this time last year that the 7A loan program required a $99 million subsidy uh, to continue operating in fiscal year 2020. Um, in the coming days, we're set to receive the fiscal year 2021 numbers. Um, will the 7A loan program and or the 504 CDC loan program require a subsidy moving forward? Um, I'm sorry, I, I won't be able to answer that question. Uh, the, uh, the Office of Capital Access and OCRIM are not at all involved in right. determining what the subsidy model uh, you know, components are and how it's going to be developed. That really resides with our OCFO office. E expecting anticipating that answer, let me, let me uh, ask the question in, in another way. Um, how have the uh, 7A loan program and the 504 loan program uh, performed this year compared to last year? So I would say that overall the entire portfolio is performing well, both in 7A and 504. 504 defaults are at a remarkable low level, remarkably low level. Uh, 7A, we've seen uh, uh, early defaults in 7A creeping up slightly year over year, but not changing dramatically and are not presently a cause for concern. Okay, thank you. Um, as you stated in your testimony, the SBA lending programs are reserved for, quote, credit worthy small businesses that otherwise would not be able to access capital to start or expand their business, unquote. We want to continue to work with your office to ensure the appropriate small businesses have access uh, to these programs. Um, what, if any, additional tools do you think that you might need uh, uh, at your disposal uh, to meet this mission? Anything come to mind? Thank you very much for asking. I think at this point, we're still trying to digest all the changes that have come about uh, because of the act that you all were so wonderful to, to uh, provide for us and the additional authority provided to us. We're actually also making changes organizationally and functionally to make sure that we can do everything from a regulatory standpoint that we're charged with and do it well. Uh, we want to, obviously, interest is, uh, is in, in sustaining program integrity for the long term and serving the needs of the small businesses who really need access to capital. So I think we need a little more time to digest everything before I can recommend anything new that we might need in terms of authority. Thank you very much. Since 
some in single digits is however much time I got left, I'm going to yield back rather than uh, go over here. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. And now we recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Evans, for five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. For the 70A loan program, SBA is not the direct lender. Instead, it relies on private sector lenders and these private sector lenders are mostly banks, but also include small business uh, lending companies. FinTech lending has become increasingly popular for small business looking for loans. Are there any plans for the SBA to engage with FinTech lenders, and do you think it should? Thank you for the question. I appreciate it very much. We have uh, talked to a number of fintech lenders through the course of the last couple of years. Um, the uh, there isn't a uh, easy relationship between what they do and what we do at this point in time, but we're learning from one another. And the result of just that concept of quick decisioning and internet-based applications has helped foster the lender match program at SBA. You may have heard of that. It's an online application that is actually free to the borrower or the proposed borrower and enables uh, a number of lenders in participating in the 7A program to review applications that come in uh, right to the SBA website. It's a very successful program. It's actually uh, going forward and being improved now. And by the end of, I believe, March, uh, we're going to have a Spanish version of the lender match. So you are, you, you are going to engage... Uh, with fintechs? It's a very similar approach to the fintech uh, solution uh, because it is an internet-based application. Yes, mm -hmm. that's similar. It's not, we're not really working through one of the fintechs to do this, however. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question, sir? Yes, you did. Okay. Uh, in your written statement, you said that your office participates in informal and formal enforcement actions, including volunteer agreements and suspensions from participation of S SBA programs. How many enforcement actions did your office initiate in 2019, and what were the nature of these actions? In 2019, we had informal and, for and formal enforcement actions. Uh, I think it was five. Um, we have since then taken additional actions in fiscal 20, uh, and uh, we are continuing to be rigorous in our approach to suspension and enforcement activities. Uh, the informal activities generally involve uh, calling a lender into a headquarters meeting, which is actually a very serious occasion where we sit down with them and we ask them if they understand why they're not compliant with our requirements and what we can do to get them on track. We want them on a compliant path, obviously, to go forward. Uh, and then secondly, um, we have uh, voluntary agreements. So if, it, if it's a PLP lender, a preferred lender that has delegated authority, we'll ask them to please stand by and delegated authority and submit all of their loan, uh, loan applications to the center in Citrus Heights for their review, underwriting, and approval so we can track through the center how they're performing in terms of application activity. Are their applications complete? Do they really catch everything from a credit administration standpoint in the credit memo? Do they follow up and, and abide by the credit elsewhere criteria? All of that can be checked by the center and they feed that information back to us. When we think that they've solved their problems and they're performing well, then we're willing to let them use delegated authority then again, but not until then. This is sort of somewhat of a piggyback on the, the chairwoman's question earlier um, about resources. The 7A loan program has been rapid growth in recent years. And in fiscal 2012, the program approved $15.2 billion in loans. By fiscal 2017, that number increased to $25.4 billion. Ms. Stryker, how has your office adapted to this rapid growth, and does it need additional resources to provide effective oversight of credit risk? I think what I heard you when you was responding to the, the chairwoman, you said, kind of gave an answer that wasn't that clear to me. Okay. Um, happy to have to provide additional information. We have a great a data warehouse called the Loan and Lender Monitoring System, LLMS for short, is managed for us by Dun & Bradstreet. And that system provides great data analytics for us to measure performance by loan, by loan segment, by industry, by industry type, 
by ge geography and a variety of other segmentations that we can perform of the portfolio to identify where risk is in the portfolio, where emerging risk may be, and then what we need to do to mitigate it. So that information is readily available from LLMS, and we use that information weekly, monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, and annually. Intense deep dives into certain aspects and segment segments of the portfolio give us great data to use to determine what kind of course of action we, as a risk identifying and mitigating group, have to proceed to get make sure that we have uh, managed risk in the portfolio for 7A. Did Thank I do a better you know. job of answering um, that question? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the yeah. time has expired. Yes. Thank you. Now we recognize uh, the ranking member of the subcommittee on economic growth, tax, and capital access. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Hearn. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, Ranking Member Shabbat. Uh, Director Strike, thanks for being here. Um, as a ranking member of the Small Business Committee, uh, Subcommittee on the Economic Growth Tax and Capital Access, I understand the need for small businesses and entrepreneurs to obtain access to capital. Additionally, as a founder uh, of a small community bank, I also understand that heavy financial risk involved with lending and loan programs such as this, uh, sort of a loan of last resort, if you will, uh, uh, having experience with both the banking and the business side, I find it, it's essential that we have the necessary checks and balances in place to ensure that the SBA's loan programs are being properly executed and that the government isn't being taken advantage of due to lack of oversight. So thank you. As you know, the 7A loan program gives small businesses the opportunity to gain access to capital who often don't have the capacity to gain funding on their own. This pro uh, successful program has provided nearly 52,000 loans for small businesses and entrepreneurs across the country and the program operates by taking fees which allow the SBA to run the loan program efficiently, efficiently while also protecting our taxpayers. These built-in fees meant to cover all program costs have been sufficient until recently as the 7A program claimed the need for a $99 million subsidy in FY20. As someone who has successfully managed budgets his whole life, this was very concerning. Uh, it was concerning for every member on the panel, the chairwoman on both sides of the aisle here. To go from self-sufficiency to reliance on a $99 million subsidy leaves me with numerous questions, including the following. And uh, I appreciate I've been listening to you for a short minutes here, and you've, you've got answers. Uh, when your former CFO was here, he seemed not to have any answers to the tough questions. So thank you for coming prepared to answer questions today. Um, Director Strike, what performance characteristics contributed to the 7A loan program needing subsidy was it performance declining? What are you seeing today? You've described some of those as I was walking in here. Could you talk to us about what, what, what are you needing? So, Congressman, I don't have specific uh, information into the components and uh, into the subsidy model that created uh, those created by our OCFO office in conjunction with OMB. Um, that information is closely held and they segregate that away from those of us that actually are involved in the capital access side for purposes of, uh, you know, making but, but sure that but we're you're in But you're in credit risk, and I, right. I don't want it to be confrontational, but you're mm -hmm. in credit risk. So you look at a lot of actuarial data. You look at historical data. We don't ever throw that away. Mm -hmm. You described a growing economy. You described a um, default rate that's you're collecting your, your monies. And so it's, it's hard for us, I think. I don't think most members' uh, uh, thoughts have changed on this because we haven't had anything to change it. The economy's even gotten better. Um, we haven't heard a lot or if anything about business failure. So what, in your assessment of credit, uh, credit risk, there has to be some thoughts about what would go on to drive this need for extra money to, to some mythical credit risk. So let me go back to my banking and lending days uh, and running a, running a, a SBA loan production center uh, and talk to you about just the countercyclical nature of SBA loans because I think that will help be helpful. During the Re Great Recession, uh, SBA lending really took off and we did a lot of we put, we put in the portfolio a lot of really high credit worthy borrowers because the banks and others, as you might recall, stopped doing lending almost entirely. So to on, the only way some of these uh, borrowers could get money was through the SPA loan program. Um, as a result, the, uh, the, with the economy being strong, that, that has been, um, th those loans performed really well. Um, now those loans are refinancing and going conventional because the conventional credit box during a strong economy has actually been opened up. As a lender, if you have, uh, if you have a conservative credit box during tough times, you have a, a more open credit box, as you, as you probably did at your community bank, during good times. And as a result, more loans are going through 
um, that process conventionally, which is really the purpose of the program, and then we are getting loans that may be a little higher risk and falling outside of the conventional, the new conventional pre credit parameters. If I may stop, because I got one other question, but I, I like uh -huh. the word you just put in there, may be. They haven't proven to be, and so they're not based on really historical facts, they're based on presumption, and so we haven't seen that yet. Let me ask you this last question before we, before we lose our time here. As a result of the 7A loan program having a subsidy, what has the off your office done to ensure taxpayer dollars are being protected moving forward? So we, d we identify through each of our lender reviews, targeted and full reviews, we pull credit files, loan files from the lenders, and we review each and every page of each and every file, usually thousands of pages, to make sure that they're being compliant with SBA's requirements. If we identify deficiencies during those loan file reviews, we communicate that information back to the centers that are involved in the operations side, the origination and the guarantee purchase centers, through the CRON, which is a communication, electronic communication tool. We tell them where to focus their attention if that loan goes into default and ends up with a purchase request to honor the guarantee at the, at the NGPC, which is the National Guarantee Purchase Center in Herndon, then that, that uh, financial analyst that pulls that information up on the CRON can go right to that part of the file, identify whether there's a deficiency that's material, and if so, can either, susp either repair or deny the guarantee. That enables us to make sure that we're not providing dollars, taxpayer dollars, unnecessarily and inappropriately to a lender who's done the wrong thing. Thank you. I'm Madam Chairwoman, if I may, I'd like to recognize the fact that the SBA sent us somebody that actually has answers to some of our questions. So I really appreciate that. This is a refreshing uh, follow-up to uh, the former member that was here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, time has expired, and now we recognize... We don't, we don't compliment witnesses around here that much, so that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Schneider, for five minutes. Thank you, and uh, Madam uh, Chairwoman, thank you for having this hearing. Uh, Ms. Strike, thank you for uh, being here and, and sharing that. I will echo the comments of my colleague, uh, Mr. Hearn. I think that's important. I think he was touching on some important issues. As you related, the, the counter-cyclicality counter of uh, the portfolio uh, within the, the SBA, and uh, as the economy is growing, uh, access to capital is still critically important, to, especially for small businesses who struggle even in conventional lending markets to tell their story. Often they may not have the, the track record of, of a, a larger business or a, a more tenured business. It's a startup. And so these opportunities are, are, are vitally important to continue to, conti to, continue to grow our, our economy. Uh, at the same time, while I think it's important that uh, SBA lending be uh, easily accessed, efficient, effective. We need to ma monitor and, and manage the, the credit. As you are implementing the recommendations of, of the OIG report of your look, as you're looking to the future, what are some of the key things we need to do to make sure that we are protecting against uh, inappropriate risk, uh, identifying and, and addressing it when lenders are, are behaving inappro inappropriately, but making sure that we maintain that access for small businesses to, to, to get the capital they need to grow their uh, businesses? That's a great question. One of the challenges that we are uh, working with across our, all of our capital access team, especially our uh, uh, Office of Financial Assistance and our uh, Office of Financial Program Operations, is what kind of additional training we can provide to lenders on a regular basis through our district offices, um, through the Office of, of, of uh, Field Operations, as well as directly. Uh, we did uh, 16 conferences last year alone, uh, both uh, district level, regional, and trade associations. We do right webinars regularly. The whole goal is to make sure that lenders don't uh, do the wrong thing, don't ma make a misstep. There's nothing worse uh, if you're a small business person and relying upon your bank to be judicious in the amount of credit they're willing to give you than to have them give you too much, you can't afford to repay it, and all of a sudden then you're in trouble. Right. right? So uh, we used to say, uh, very similar to the medical community, at first do no harm. Right, And so one of the things that we've seen in our reviews of certain loan files for certain lenders this last year is that, in fact, what's happening in part is smaller transactions are being overfunded, and as a result, the, the borrowers are not able to repay that entire amount. They probably could have gotten away with significantly less money, and it would have been much affor more affordable for them. So it's our job, in part, to make sure that we are working with the trade associations and the districts and all other op opportunities to provide 
provide that kind of insight and feedback to the lenders to get them to make sure that they're actually making good judicious credit decisions. I, I think that's important. Uh, you talked about you know conventional uh, lending. Uh, Oftentimes here we're talking about unconventional ideas, unconventional risks. That doesn't mean they're inappropriate. That doesn't mean they are uh, 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 outside the range of, of, of what is an acceptable risk. But if you take them too far, I like to say I, I grew up uh, near the mountains, and I, I'm very comfortable driving on mountain roads. I tend to keep both wheels on the road and, and in the center. I try not to go too far to the edge, and that's what I want these small businesses to be able to do, to, to take the risk, to, to make the ascent but to do it in a way that uh, is supported by the lenders. So I think it's important to communicate that. How do we, taking that a step further, how do we make sure that, and this may be outside your role, that the, the lenders are, are getting out to the marketplace so that small businesses understand what's available to them, that there is an opportunity to get capital uh, to, to fund their ideas and, and invest in their business, but to do it in a way that's prudent and appropriate for them? You know, that, that is an interesting question. When I started in this business in 1981, uh, as a 503 lender, um, nobody knew what SBA was, but they were horrified that they might, as a small business borrower, need to access any capital through the SBA. It was a terrible reputation. So we had to try to figure out how to sell everything um, by, by developing some kind of uh, you know, credibility with the small business borrower first. Uh, that's not true today. Uh, today, wherever I go, I like to talk to uh, entrepreneurs, restaurants, uh, my physical therapy uh, office. I like to ask them, you know, how did you get to this point? Uh, and I love hearing them say, well, I got an SBA loan. And then I always ask them from whom because I just like to know who's active in each marketplace. And I just think it just speaks to the fact that lenders generally really like, many lenders really like this program, and they really are out there offering a, uh, to the marketplace in a very active way. That's wonderful. That's, they're, they're, uh, they're an adjunct to our educational opportunity for the marketplace. Right. And uh, just to close, I'm a little bit past my time, but the role that we can play as members of Congress in engaging in our community, we have seminars, roundtables, we bring uh, entrepreneurs together to say, hey, we can make a difference. And I look forward to continuing that. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. And now we recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Burchett, for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Lady, Ranking Member. It's always a pleasure being here, ma'am. Um, and thank you, ma'am, for being here with us. Um, and let me make sure I got the name right. Strike, is that how you say it? Just like strike through and you're out. Yes. All right. Well, Burchett, just like the tree and Birch like the tree and et like I just at lunch, which I which I didn't. But the chair lady always promises me she's gonna bring me a meal, but she never does. So anyway, that's just what happens here in Congress, I guess. But but I, does the Office of Cre of Credit Risk Management need any additional oversight tools to further protect our taxpayer dollars uh, within the uh, microloan program? And if so, what would you request? It's a great question. I, I can't answer it today. We uh, have as our goal to take on micro lender oversight in 2020, but we are just starting to recruit for that position, uh, and we'll be taking over the oversight that the program office has been engaged in heretofore. So in, in another three to six months, I'll be able to probably answer that question much better than I can today. Okay. That's an honest answer, so thank you. Let me ask you one more. What is the current oversight plan that the Office of Credit Risk Management has in place to um, oversee the microloan program? So micro lenders, as you know, uh, are intermediaries for us. We provide a loan to them, and they actually provide the loans to, uh, to micro lending opportunities, and they're usually within their community. And they do that very well. Um, their performance overall has been very stellar uh, in terms of their portfolio. And what we want to be able to do is examine what they're doing, make sure it's compliant with any requirements that the SBA has for their performance, and make sure that they're uh, servicing those loans uh, very, very well and diligently, and that if, if we request information or access to their files, that they'll allow us to, ha to have a chance to look at them. Very Thank basic. You. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Chair Lady, Ranking Member, I yield back the remainder two minutes and 59 seconds of my time. Please use it wisely, as I know you will. <laughs> the gentleman is back, and now we recognize the gentleman from Maine, Mr. Golden, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Director Strike, thanks for being with us today. I um, wanted to uh, follow up on an earlier conversation you were having. Does SBA assign loan brokers and agents with unique identifiers to systematically track their activity? Not at this time, no, sir. 
And would there be any benefit to your office in carrying out your role uh, if you were to do that? I don't believe so at this time. Uh, we have a variety of tools available to us to track loan agent performance uh, by lender uh, that they have relationships with. Uh, one way is through the, uh, through the review process, and we ask the lender to provide a great deal of information, including the agreements that they have with those loan agents. We review those and see what kind of relationship there is and what kind of services are provided and what kind of fees are being charged and to whom. We also have the Form 159, which is a form that really gives us a great deal of information for any fees that are charged during the course of a loan origination, whether it's by the lender uh, or by a loan agent. And we use that information and are just starting to aggregate that so that we can determine and monitor loan agent risk and performance of each individual loan that they've referred into a specific lender. If we see that there's a, a trend that lender, a lender specifically with a relationship with a loan agent is, is experiencing challenges with their portfolio performance, then we're talking to them about why they're accept, continuing to accept referrals from that loan agent if, in fact, their performance is uh, less than adequate. You have a good level of confidence that you're pulling in the information that you need uh, to have visibility and that it's compiled in a way that's easy for you and your staff to, to put it to good use. Well, we're certainly getting the information. We're still working on the best way to compile it and access it uh, so that it's easier to automate and electronically available to us. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Ms. Strike, thank you very much. And I'm happy, it's like a breath of fresh air to bring someone from the administration, SBA, that really provides uh, the facts and, uh, and is able to provide the answers uh, to our questions. And uh, I really feel confident that you're doing a very good job. Thank you. So we now learned more about a key function of the SBA capital access programs, and one without which the programs could function effectively. However, we have also learned that there is more work to be done towards ensuring proper oversight and accountability over SBA's partner lenders. If we intend to continue enhancing access to affordable capital for small businesses, it is clear SBA's Office of Credit Risk Management will be a key stakeholder. I look forward to working with my colleagues from across the aisle as we continue to work to enhance the efficiency of SBA's operations and more broadly to continue enhancing access to capital for America's small businesses. I would ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statement and supporting materials for the record. Without objection, so order. And if there's no further business to come before the committee, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>